Let's go to prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, we ask for your will. Father, we are hungry for your word, and we depend solely upon the live word being interpreted to us through your Holy Spirit. Give us wisdom, give us hunger for your word, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, I remember when I was just a young guy, <clears throat> had been married for just a few months, and I was asked to speak at this church. And um, I was starting my junior year of college. And I had this little office there in the hallway, <laughs> kind of an offset in the hallway there in the church. And the pastor came by one day and he saw me and he says, Dwayne, he says, he says, how you doing? Are you getting ready for, for your sermon? And I explained to him how I was, I, was, I was fighting with it, I was struggling, I was scared, all of these things. And he sat down. This man, who I still think is one of the greatest men I've ever met, and one of the greatest men. And he says, you know, he says, I look back when I was young and I did my first sermon. And he says, I got up in front of those people and he says, I preached my heart out. And all of a sudden, I was done and the people just stared at me. And I thought, what's happened? I've preached my heart out to these people and they're just looking at me. And then he realized that his sermon was only five minutes. <laughs> so, I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, there is so much in the third chapter of Acts that I won't have that problem today. <laughs> you know, we, we need to kind of look back and get some background uh, on this. <laughs> there we go. That's okay, Mike. I'll, I'll pick it up. Um, we need to get a little bit of background to kind of understand what's happening. What in the world has taken place that causes this tremendous revival on the day of Pentecost where over 10,000 people accepted the Lord? What has taken place? Because it's just been a very, very short time between the day of Pentecost and when the Lord had been crucified. We look at the disciples who were just a few weeks ago sitting in a room depressed because they had uh, lost the king who they thought was going to develop a kingship where they would be part of it in and now, present day, their present day, setting there depressed because now what happens? I've sold everything, I've given up my occupations. What can I, what, what's happening now? Because now who we had placed everything into has died, has been killed. This depression, of course, was almost only lasted for three days. Because at the end of those three days, they learned that their Christ had not, had died, but also had risen. And for 40 more days, after three years of spending this time with Jesus, when he came back to them, 40 more days of training and instruction through the Holy Spirit occurred. And then at the time, that time, then he says, you're not ready yet to go out and conquer what, I, what God has planned for mankind. He says, so stay here in Jerusalem and you will receive the gift that will give you this power. 
to accomplish and to do what God wants done in this world. And he says, but, but then the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples. He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. And I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you is a gift that would not, that would and cannot give, no, that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you, I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really love me, you will be happy that I am going to the Father who is greater than I. I have told you these things before they happen so that when they happen, you will believe. Now this was quite, this was weeks before Jesus had died, had, had been killed. But he's prophesying to these disciples and saying, this is what's gonna happen. And I'm telling you, this is gonna happen right now so that when it happens, you will know that I am the God, that I am Jesus, and for my purpose. Our training with God and the Word uh, in the re is it starts with our confession, knowing that Jesus Christ is the Savior. And our training starts that very day because that very day is when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to wait for 40 days. We don't have three years, but we just, we have that. Jesus promised to John, Peter, and all of us, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. So he's, so the spirit of God that we receive now, the moment that we have acknowledged the, the, that our sins need to be addressed by confessing God and then turning to God. Sometimes we look at salvation and people look at it differently. They say, well, yeah, I raised my hand in church at the altar call and said, yep, I'm a sinner. Or I go into this little booth and confess to someone, yep, I'm a sinner. And then we walk out the door, okay, good until January, type thing. It's not the way it works, ladies and gentlemen. It's the confession of your sins and turning to God. And it's at that point that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And by filled, we're talking about somebody who is going to lead us, who's going to teach us, and who's going to strengthen us. John 16, 3, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He's here to teach us, John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Sometimes when we're witnessing to somebody or somebody's asking for help, aren't you amazed 
as spirit-filled Christians, aren't you amazed how God sometimes just brings the right words to say to these people? This scripture just leads us right there. And then when we're hurting and we know that things in life just aren't going the way we want them to go, looking for somebody for strength. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning to deep, wor in deep words. He's groaning. He's, he is so anxious to relay our needs to God. Sometimes God, in other verses, is referred to as he who seeks their, or reads their hearts. Here the Holy Spirit is groaning and deep and hard and, and jealousy that he will, that God knows the heart through the Holy Spirit of us. So the Holy Spirit is interceding for us that we may receive strength. For we do not know what, what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning to deep, uh, too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. He who searches hearts, that's God. He searches our hearts. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. That is so important. But we can be assured that what the Holy Spirit is interceding, interceding for us, that answer that the Holy Spirit that is interceded for us, we can be assured that that is the will of God. He would not do it any other way. And so you see the need for the disciples to wait until they had this additional power to go out into the world and talk to the, to the world. And at this time, their main emphasis, of course, it being that they were told to wait in Jerusalem, and their main emphasis, therefore, is on the Jewish nation, where God had said, that these are my chosen people, and he's going to come to them first. And he did. But he, they need to have the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the third chapter of Acts, we're going to see where that power leads to the conversion of over 10,000 people. Now, the day of Pentecost uh, was one of the three major Jewish uh, holidays held there in Jerusalem. And think of this now, that the, uh, the town of Jerusalem during this worship of the synagogue was being inundated by thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews from all over the known world, all of them speaking different languages. But they were coming as, as Jews back to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. So the believers were in Jerusalem per the orders of Jesus. And they were all meeting at one place. And there part parts of the scripture says that part of the, the when they were meeting, there was not only the ten disciples, because Thomas wasn't there but there was also approximately 120 other believers. And they were all meeting in this upper room and they were praying and fasting and the Holy Spirit came down on them and suddenly there was a sound, verse two in, in Acts, suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. 
We don't have to do anything but go back to the book of Exodus where God comes down like this giant windstorm and rocks the Mount, Mount Sinai. And then, as a, and then as a flame that burns the mountain as the people there, he is striking for his appearance. He's letting people know, I'm God, I'm powerful, here I am before you. Flames all of a sudden appear on the tongues of these crowded believers all around them. Flames, here's what's something I had always kind of overlooked, but in my study I thought, oh my gosh. Look in the Old Testament. God has always appeared as a single flame of fire, not as multiple flames of fire. The flame of fire that scorched the tops of Mount Sinai. The flame of fire that came down into the tabernacle, simulating, simulating that he was there. The flame that consumed the bush that wasn't, or excuse me, that didn't consume the bush. All of these things were to show that, the, that God was there. But all of a sudden, here we have all of these people, and they all had their own personal flame. Totally different. And it's because now Jesus has died for us, he has taken away our sins, and he is filling us with the Holy Spirit. And so now that flame indicates that God, the Holy Spirit, is in us as individuals. We are walking around in the seal of God's Holy Spirit. He's both in us, he guides us, he directs us. And so all of that leads up to chapter 3. In chapter 3, I, I, was, I was reading it, and I, and I thought, what's the real theme that I have? Not the theme that some theologian or commentary or whatever, but what did I get out of chapter number 3? And I got, number one, the boldness given by the Holy Spirit the power of the name of Jesus Christ, the willingness of God to forgive even to those who killed his son. Acts 1 through 11 uh, finds that Peter and John are walking to the temple at approximately three o'clock in the afternoon. Now it's kind of important because three o'clock in the afternoon is in fact the standard time when all go to the temple for prayer. It's also in conjunction with a time of offering. So as they approach the temple, uh, there's a lame man setting outside of the gate. We know the story. I looked at this and I'm trying to think, okay, what's the importance? Because I'm sure that outside of this gate known as the beautiful gate, the main, the, the one of the main gates used by the Jewish people to enter into the different courts of worship and prayer, Outside of that gate, where this man had to be carried and set there, there must have been a lot of other uh, lame and needy people there as well. Why did Peter and John look at him? And it says, as they approached the temple, a man lame from birth. Now here's a guy never in his whole life ever 
took a step on his own, ever. Lame from birth, was being carried in. Each day he was, he was put beside the temple gate and one called, the one called the beautiful gate so that he could beg from the people who were coming for prayer, right? Now, this lame man, it's very important to know that he was 40 years plus old, as we find out in chapter four, actually. So for 40 years, people were carrying him from point A, wherever that might have been, to the gate. Every day, they said, that every day he got carried to this gate. Now, I don't know if these were friends or family or maybe some of the money that he would collect through begging. Maybe he paid somebody to carry him there every day. We don't know. We don't know. But we know <clears throat> that for 40 years now, this guy has been at the same place every day. So especially the local people, they knew him very well. They knew him because he's been there for years and years and years at the same place, the same time, every day. Therefore, being very well known, he was also known to be crippled from birth, having no ability to even go into the temple. I find that too something interesting that because he was crippled, he was considered unclean. And therefore he never got to enter the temple area. He was always left outside at the gate. This lame man was probably, after 40 years, I would say that he was a man without hope. A man who felt that his life was doomed to what he was doing, and that was begging for money just to make a living. Number two, the fact that he had to be carried from point A to point B every day meant that he couldn't get out and around it's a good chance that he didn't even know who Jesus was. Probably had never been aware of Jesus, unless maybe somebody passing by him in the temple said something about Jesus. So he's not a believer. He just doesn't know. He's sitting there all by himself for 40 years. Seeing this, verses three through six. Peter seeing, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, and he did, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them, expecting to receive money not healing, not anything else, just money. It's all, he, it's all he knew. But Peter said, I'm dead broke, man. I don't have a penny in my pocket. He says, no silver, no gold. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Can you imagine what this guy, here he is, he's got his hand reached out, and he's saying, I'd like to have some money. And Peter turns to him and looks at him along with John, and he says, we don't have any money. And he's kind of like this. But Peter reaches out and takes him by the hand that he had reached out for his money, reaches out to take him by the hand to offer him what Peter did have. 
And Peter reaches out and takes him and helps him to his feet. As he is being helped to his feet, all of a sudden, instantly, healing has starts pouring through this man who has been crippled for over 40 years. Instantly. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. As he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple for the very first time. Oh my gosh. Could that, could that not have, I mean, it's like, I, when I was reading all of that, and what happened to this guy, a phrase came to me just as I'm sitting there and I'm thinking and I'm trying to imagine how this man felt. And I got to thinking, what about Peter and John? How did they feel? And I couldn't help but think of the phrase, God just keeps on giving. Isn't that the truth? All of a sudden you think this is, going to, this is great. Oh, this is greater. This is even greater. God just keeps on giving. And so God provides both the path to eternal life, which was the gift, the gift of salvation, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This man received all of those things because he realized after he was bringing up God, Re let this man see who God really was because the Bible says he not only jumped up and started walking and leaping and everything, but what? He was praising God. So although it was the faith of Peter and John through the guidance of the Holy Spirit that turned to this man and 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 took this man under their wing and, and brought him, and through the leading of the Holy Spirit, took him by the hand and embraced him and pulled him up. The man did not say, oh, thank you, John and Peter. He went about praising God. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Now, this here is actually, and for all the people that were watching, this was a fulfillment of prophecy. If you look into Isaiah 35, verses 5 through 6, Isaiah is speaking prophesying of the coming Christ. And he says, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer. Whoa, does that ring a bell? Leap like a deer. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Nobody realized that in this one moment, the apostles were not, John and Peter, were not only healing this man, they were fulfilling prophecy. How, and, and, and the man himself didn't realize he was fulfilling prophecy, didn't, wasn't aware. Because then, in those days, probably never had scripture read to him because he was never inside the temple. The actions of just that one event of the Holy Spirit being uh, guiding Peter and Paul on this one situation, choosing this man 
rather than the many others that were most likely at the gate as well. They chose this man. Those actions led to the rest of this chapter and what doors were God opened because of that obedience. And then 12 through 15, it says, and when Peter saw it, saw it, he addressed, well, wait a minute, oh yes. He says, and when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though, you, as though by our own power and, pi and piety we have made him walk? No, not us, he says. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. So even though Pilate was going to turn him loose because he found him not guilty, they said, no, don't do that. And then verse 15, ooh, that's a powerful verse, and Peter's not pulling any punches here. He says, but verse 14 says, 14 and 15, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. What is it that he's witnessed? Peter and John is saying that they are witnesses to everything that he just accused them of. So he's not accusing them because of something he heard. But Luke here is writing that Peter and John, they were witnesses to the crucifixion of the Lord. They were witnesses to his uh, victory over death. They were witnesses to his promise to come to Israel as, and, and, uh, and be their Christ, their Messiah. He was witnesses to this. So Peter is now telling the people, you just saw the lame man healed in the name of Jesus Christ of Lazarus, and this is the same Jesus just a few days ago you killed. Well, that's not scripture, that's my language, okay? But that's what they're saying. That's what they're saying. Repent, therefore, verses 19 and 20. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from this presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. Their Christ, whom they expected to come and save them from the Roman Empire to set up his own kingdom. They killed him. But now, turn back to God. Repent your sins. Turn back to God. For this very same Jesus that you killed is going to return to you. And here again, a major emphasis on what I spoke earlier about. Salvation is more than just confessing sins. It must also include turning back to God. We have to, it's more than just knowing that we're a sinner but it's also asking God, who is the only path to salvation through Jesus Christ, to forgive us and to turn back to him and be filled with the Spirit so that you can walk in the guidance of God. 
that, your, that the seed in the parable does not fall on stony ground or on bare ground that's torched. But this confession, because you turn back to God, seals you with the Holy Spirit so that you can, this Spirit will be yours for eternity. As long as you're with God, the Spirit of God is with you, guiding you, directing you. Peter uses the words of the prophet Hosea. Return, O Israel. Return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with your words and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away our iniquity. Confession must be accompanied. Acts 24 through 26. And all the prophets who have spoken, oh, you know what, let me back up here a second. Uh, in, in Peter and Paul talking to the crowd, they said, you know what, you should have known this. You should have known that this was the Christ. Because it's in all, all the prophets, all the way back to Samuel, have told you about the coming Christ. They have all said this. You should have known. So it was not in ignorance but it was selfish sin uh, that has prevented you from being able to see this. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and all those who came after him also proclaimed these days. Here's Peter speaking to them again. And in doing so, he's referring to a scripture in Deuteronomy. He says, Moses continued, verse 15, he said, both, uh, Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19. Moses continued, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him, for this is what you yourselves requested of the Lord your God when you were assembled at Mount Sinai, you said, don't let us hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore or see this blazing fire, for we will die. Then 17, the Lord says, then the Lord said to me, Moses, what they have said is right. I will raise up a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. I will put my words in his mouth. I will tell the people everything I have, he will tell the people everything I have commanded him. And I will personally deal with anyone who will not listen to the messages of the prophet pro proclaimed on my behalf. Even before Samuel, here's Moses and God talking to Moses, prophesying Jesus. And this verse is kind of hard unless you kind of understand here what's going on. If you remember, Moses was called up to the top of Mount Sinai. And he, he was prior to that, he was told to have all the people gather at the foot of Mount Sinai, but not dare touch or come up on the mountain, at least they die, because God's presence was going to be there. And everyone feared that if they saw the face of God or they stood in the presence of God, they would die. But Moses, on the orders of Christ, these people come and he warns them, do not come upon the mountain itself but stand around it. And then God calls Moses up to the top of the mountain. And he comes back and the mountain literally shakes. The Bible says 
It was so powerful, God's presence was so powerful that he moved the Mount Sinai. Thunderstorms and, and lightning occurred. And then a great flame of God came and scorched the top of Mount Sinai. When Moses came back down, the people were afraid of God. But God was doing this so that they would have the proper, the proper fear of God. Not that the fear of death so much as the fear of the power of their God, to follow their God and to be ruled and guided and directed by their power, by God's power there at Mount Sinai. And that he was going to send them a person that would guide them as well. Twenty-four, verse 24 of Acts through 26. Again, just establishes what I've just talked about, how that the, it goes back and he talks about this, uh, Samuel and the prophets there. So the people weren't concerned. Let me make one more point here too. The people didn't want God to talk to them anymore. They wanted somebody to intercede for them before God so that they wouldn't have take the chance of being killed so that we would not die. So they wanted an, in, someone to intercede for them. And Moses is saying that for right now it's me, but there will be one that comes who's greater than me and directs you in the commandments of God. Verse 26, God having raised up his servants, sent him to you first. This is Paul still speaking to the crowds. To bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. From the work of the disciples, now you see that here, you're beginning to see how the chapter, what happened with Paul speaking to and, he, and through Jesus healing this one man. This one man, so well known, that now everyone in the town, having known this crippled, this lame person, and now sees him walking around town, jumping and leaping and praising God. There's no way that they can deny it because now they too are witnesses. So now he has them as their own witness to the power. And he's already said, it wasn't me, it wasn't John. We healed this man through the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the man who you killed. But now they are witnesses, and they must live with this every time they see this man running and jumping and leaping and praising God, because he didn't die. He became a witness in Jerusalem. A great witness, in fact. You say that he clang, he clinged to Peter and John when they went into the temple. He went into the temple clinging to them. And all the people in the temple, what are you going to say? Oh, no, this was, this was false. This was, this was magic. This, no, they knew because this man wasn't praising some false god. This man wasn't joying and leaping. This man had fulfilled prophecy. This man was praising the God. They were witnesses to all of this.
from this, the day of Pentecost and from the services of the Jews or the, the, the servicing of the many that came to Jerusalem this week, because of this act and because of the, of the, uh, of the blessing of the Holy Spirit and the tongue in tongues that were uh, relayed uh, or the gift that was given to many who spoke in the foreign languages, between these times of that day of Ippon Pentecost to here, tens of thousands, one theologian said, tens of thousands of Jews accepted the Lord. Because it talks about the 5,000 and it talks about the 3,000, but in the process, all of that, it talks about men who heard. And so the theologians think, okay, so the women also are in that. And then that grew. And it said, and we'll find later in chapter 4, that they, that divine, uh, turning, not paying any attention to the commands that they cease uh, preaching and using the name of Jesus, they ignored it. And they started going door to door and throughout the entire city. And they're saying over 10,000 salvations. Oh, I pray that that, that uh, would happen here. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see that here, right here in Twin Falls? 10,000? <laughs> I want to leave a couple of verses here with you as I quit. How am I doing, Mike? Am I about on time? Good. <laughs> I want to leave this verse. A couple of them then. Just as a... Just as a a blessing, just to end on this blessing note of what God can do and use for us. It says Ephesians 13, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. In him you also, that's us, when you hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. It's like walking around wrapped in cellophane. You're just all sealed. Nothing's going to escape from the blessings of that spirit that is inside you. Who is the guarantee of your inheritance until we acquire possession of it? The guarantee of our salvation the inheritance that God has promised us. That's the proof here that when we walk in the Spirit, we feel the Spirit. It says, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And in Romans 8, 26 through 28, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness for example, we do not we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Whew. Just thought I'd leave you with those. Those are very, those verses we can live by, ladies and gentlemen. Those are verses that guarantee what we've experienced in God. Let us close in prayer. Our Father, we take these words. And we come before you, Father, not to hear man's knowledge, but to hear your words portrayed to us through the Holy Spirit. May they seek deep into our hearts that we may not only live by them to serve you, but remember them in our hope that our treasures are on hold 
You've got them up there. You're just waiting for us. But you guaranteed them to us. Help us through our day-to-day -day lives. May the Spirit of God be our guide to joy, refreshing, and hope. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.